Okay, so 1899 is now out, and the new Netflix series has a lot to unpack from its ending. Throughout this video, I want to break down the series, all the hidden details in it, and also go over what happens in its final few scenes. What I love about the series is that it starts to fall into your thinking that you've figured out the ending of it, but then the last couple of minutes just completely pull the rug out from under you. You're probably thinking, what the hell is going on? And in this video, I aim to explain the ending whilst also giving my theories for what could happen next time. In the end, it's revealed that Mora is in fact in the year 2099 and on a spaceship known as the Prometheus. No, not that one. Forget about that one. However, the final scene actually shares some similarities to the voyages that are often depicted in sci-fi movies. In order to make the long journeys, passengers are often put to sleep in stasis, and this show makes it appear that the simulations are fed to them in order to keep their minds occupied. These characters all seemingly are down for the long nap, and Mora awakens from this to find herself on board a ship which is overseen by her brother Kieran. Now before we get into the ending, I feel like we have to talk about the major events that lead up to it. The first section of this video will be going over the influences in the show, the triangles that appear throughout, and also the details that lead towards the end. In this series, we join the passengers of the Kerberos as they head out on a voyage all the way to New York. The ending twist is that they're probably doing the same thing, but rather than heading out to America, they're heading out to a new planet. Either way, they all have their own reasons for starting a new life, with most of the characters either running from something or receiving letters from loved ones that beckon them out there. This is most notably seen from Mora, who's carrying a letter from her apparently missing brother. However, he is in fact probably calling her out to her new home. Now, sticking with the initial simulation on the boat, we watch as they come across the Kerberos' sister ship, the Prometheus, which is almost completely abandoned. This was the ship that Mora's brother was on when he apparently vanished, and we see how the other passengers have a connection to it. Now, the show draws a lot of inspiration from real life, and this is very much a vessel that's in the same vein of the Mary Celeste. That ship was found abandoned in 1872, with no sign of what happened to the crew or why they'd left it. To this day, it stands as one of the biggest unsolved mysteries, and we still don't really have a concrete answer as to what happened to the passengers. Ideas of mysteriously abandoned vessels are something that we have laced throughout horror, and in the film Event Horizon, we watch as that too is discovered with its crew completely missing. Similar to those aboard the Kerberos, the characters in the film start to have strange visions, and it adds an extra dimension of horror to all of the proceedings. Lastly, when watching this show, I also couldn't help think of the 2009 film Triangle. I don't want to spoil what happens in it, but it involves people out at sea discovering an abandoned ship and then getting stuck in a time loop. I definitely recommend that you check it out, as it's one of the most well thought out time travel movies that I, I think I've ever seen. The triangles are also laced throughout the show. I think we'd be remiss for not talking about the Bermuda Triangle and how this too influenced the series. In case you don't know, the area known as the Devil's Triangle is infamous for the amount of aircraft and ships that have disappeared whilst navigating it. There's been a number of supernatural explanations for this, ranging from giant squids to aliens, to people not liking the video and being cursed because of it. All of these aspects came to mind when watching 1899 as those on the Kerberos try to get to the bottom of what was going on. Now, in case you don't know, Kerberos is actually a technical term that also has links to Greek mythology. The word actually originates from Cerberus, and if you know your myths and legends, then you'll be aware that this character guarded the underworld. This idea of a figure being the thing that's put in place between two worlds is also how it's adapted in the modern day. When it comes to computers, a Kerberos is basically a security protocol, and this authenticates a request between an untrusted network and a trusted one. For example, the signal between your computer and the internet has to pass through a Kerberos first. The show of course also has doorways laced throughout it, with them being locked and unlocked at several points. We have the one connected to the ship that connects to the other side, the doorways that the little beetle unlocks, the gateway between the first and second class, and so on and so forth. When the boy is cast overboard, he of course also comes back through a doorway in a cabinet, which is mirrored by the doorway in the cabinet on the Prometheus in the scene that we first meet him. There's very much this idea that everything has an opposite and other side to it, which is embedded in the show's DNA. The series opens with Mora talking about the human brain, which is itself divided into two sections, and her visions of an asylum hint that something else is going on here. The theme for the series is also a cover of White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane. This is based on Alice in Wonderland, and that of course was also about tumbling down the rabbit hole in order to discover a new world and an altered perception. The Prometheus also has a double meaning to it too, with this being named after the Titan who stole fire from the gods. 
He gave it to the mortals, and typically, the usage of the name is meant to mark humanity gaining a newfound knowledge. This is definitely seen in the ship, which brings with it someone who drastically alters the perspective of those on board. We very much get the idea though that someone else is working behind the scenes to control the events on the ship, and there's this constant feeling that this has all played out before. Now, this video is sponsored by Established Titles, a fun and novel way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland while helping global reforestation efforts. Established Titles lets you call yourself a lady, lord or a laird due to a traditional Scottish custom. You see, landowners used to refer to themselves as this, and Established Titles allows you to buy at least one square foot of dedicated land on a private estate in Eddleston, Scotland. On top of this, it's a great way to help out the environment, as established titles will plant a tree with every single order. They work with global charities like One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to help with reforestation efforts. So if you pick up a plot, you can refer to yourself as a lord, whilst also helping to preserve the picturesque woodlands of Scotland. Now there also comes with a bit of an ego boost on top of all this environmental stuff. You can officially change your name on credit cards, plane tickets, your dating profile, whatever you want. They also give you a certificate confirming your lordship and a unique plot number that confirms your exact plot of land. Bow before Kevin spoilers you punk, I am the lord of this realm. Now in addition to this, established titles have also told me that the first 200 people who use my link in the description below will be given a plot within walking distance of mine. It makes an amazing last minute gift and established titles is actually running a massive Black Friday sale right now. Plus if you use the code heavy spoilers you get an additional 10% off. Go to EstablishedTitles.com slash heavy spoilers to get your gifts now and help support the channel. Thanks. Now Doc repeatedly had the triquetra popping up as a symbol throughout it, and 1899 has triangles with lines running through them. This symbol actually has roots in witchcraft, and it's used as an icon to demonstrate an earth element. We learn that this triangle belonged to the company that refurbished the Kerberos, but it's something that constantly appears throughout. In episode 1, we see it on the back of letters that the passengers receive, and also on the earrings that Clemence wears. Sorry, but I need to make that a bit more French. Clemence! Now she also has a hair clip with this in two, and the triangle appears on the signs used for the cabin numbers. The triangle is of course used on the floor panel that's discovered in episode 2, and immediately after this, there's triangles on the cupboards. This is a reach, and I'm warning you, it's a reach. But the priest, yeah, his goatee, it's a triangle. Anyway, Moving on, the carpet has the symbol on it too, which we see towards the end when the bug is set free. We also have triangles appearing on the Morse code message, which is brought across to the device. A triangle is also on the pendant that Mora has at the end of episode 2, and cut to episode 3 to see one on the back of the geisha's dress. The arrows on the buttons are also of course triangles, and episode 5 gives us a good look at the ship's crew, who all wear triangles on their hats. The boy also carries a triangular pyramid device, which later appears in the wasteland outside the asylum. This is a very important thing, and the triangle with the line in it, of course, refers to this in the end. The line represents a slit, with the top opening up, and this is where Mora places the key in order to escape. So the entire time, they're basically saying, look the triangle, there's a little thing that flaps up, which great bit of foreshadowing. And we basically have a coup that forms on the ship after the captain decides to tow the Prometheus back instead of continuing to New York. If you're a fan of Dark, then you'll likely recognise him as being a character that I'll just call a traveller in case you haven't seen it. Now knowing what we know at the end, potentially he wants to turn the Prometheus around because subconsciously he wants to go back home. Got a lot of Shutter Island vibes from this due to his family's death, but beyond that, maybe he was responsible for it. He might want to return home to face up to his crimes, however their deaths might be a metaphor for him leaving them on Earth. He's of course the captain of the Kerberos, but beyond that he might be the captain of the spaceship. This might be a manifestation of his regret, him, him leaving them back on Earth, and basically that explains why the Prometheus is littered with reminders of them. His family's connection to the ship also mirrors Mora's brother apparently being there too. Now during the exploration of the vessel, they discover the young boy Elliot, and we also see Daniel climbs aboard too. Mysterious deaths start to happen, and the more superstitious people on board come to the conclusion that Elliot is causing them. The head of this is Ivan, whose family also becomes pivotal as we get into the storyline. Turns out that her son Cresta and her daughter Tove got on the wrong side of a vicious farmer, who shot the former and sexually assaulted the latter. Tove killed him, and now she's pregnant. The younger sister is killed early on, and this spurs them on to take out the person that they blame. They also want the ship to continue to New York, and thus the two sides are formed. 
Daniel warps them out of the ocean, and a passenger list is found for the Prometheus, with both Mora and the captain's name on it. Weird things begin to happen though, with Elliot coming back from being tossed overboard, and a strange black wooden shape starts forming in the hull. Secret chambers beneath the floors are also unearthed, which leads to a vast wilderness with an asylum lying at the centre of it. We learn that this is extremely similar to where Mora grew up, and discover that a father built it for her mother. Mora tells us that after she had her two children, she really started to forget things, and slowly dementia took over. Her father resented Mora and her brother because of this, and he built the asylum in order to study the human brain. He wanted to find a way to repair it, and we learn that he also owns the company that refurbished the two ships. This is an added mystery to him, as he constantly pops up throughout, and we see that he has TVs which definitely wouldn't have been available in the 1800s. Elliot refuses to talk on the most part, and instead he writes things down like they're watching us. I hope so too mate, channel's got a million subs, but not a million views per video. Really, there's actually also two things that are very similar to a certain recent movie that's just come out, with people jumping overboard, and us also getting the words sink ship. Anyway, after Elliot goes into the wilderness and the passengers fracture off, we join Mora and Ike as they head out to her father's. At the centre is the reveal that Daniel is actually Mora's husband, which was teased early on by him carrying a photo of her. Now after the captain goes to attack him, he transports him to a place where we see several other versions of the Prometheus. At this point, barely anyone on the Kerberos is left, and we see a sea storm beginning to roll in. This is actually a shutdown of the ship, and the loop that's in it with the world starting to collapse. Now the final two episodes are where things really start falling together. Netflix actually sent out the first six for review, but they held these ones back so that no secrets got out. Also, if you enjoyed the video, a bit of a segue, we'd really appreciate the thumbs up, and make sure you subscribe for breakdowns that are in ship-shape condition. Bleh. Anyway, after a romantic memory with Daniel and Mora, we get a very important discussion about what reality is. Mora talks about how one's brain very much creates its own reality, and this of course links in with the ship. She says reality doesn't exist if one's not there to experience it, and thus a person's brain interprets the world around them and creates a construct in which they see the world. Plato's cave is brought up twice in the final episodes, and in case you don't know, this is basically a thought experiment that determines how we define what reality is. It states that if a group of people were tied up in a cave together, that they would assume the shadows on the wall and the sounds that echo around the cave are all that there is. They would be unaware that there is anything outside of this, and it would become the norm that they'd end up accepting. This would be a false reality, but it would be what they define to be real, due to the shadows and sounds being all that they know. In the show, the ship at the end is very much the cave, with that determining what people think is happening, and really they're all bound together, experiencing the same thing, and thus believing that's the truth. We see at the end that each section on the Prometheus is divided up into cabins, and it's even possible that each one of these has its own simulation and world. Now this room where they get it on is an extremely important location, as it's also where Mora later discovers that she and Daniel are Elliot's parents. This might be when he was conceived, which explains why it's such a powerful memory for Daniel. Now, she didn't have access to this knowledge before, because her mind was confined to the reality that was given to her, which we see beneath the floorboards. This was her childhood home, which is why her father was a central figure that was also connected to it as well. This was the place that he experimented on her mother, but it's also the place where she selfishly tried to prolong Elliot's life. I'm guessing that time works differently in the simulation, and that keeping him there could mean that he lives for decades from his point of view. It's sort of doing an inception, with the subconscious being similar to what Cobb and Mal built with their dream homes. I'm still a bit confused over whether Elliot is actually dead or not, but either way, Mora did keep him in a sim at some point to, to keep him alive. Potentially, people's bodies age slower under stasis, and she forced him on this trip across the cosmos so they could go somewhere that he could be cured. This is similar to what we saw with Lucian, who was apparently travelling to America to get life-saving surgery. He might be going across the stars to have this carried out, and the end goal may be some place both he and Elliot can get their treatment. Now Daniel did have memories of Elliot because his reality was much later in life when Mora and he had had a child together. We also learn the passages beneath the passengers' rooms all lead to their own past places and defining moments in their lives. Daniel is locked in the main chamber, though he does eventually find a way out. Mora climbs back on board the ship, and we see the book Awakening by Kate Chopin. Published, pronounced that wrong, definitely, but it was published in 1899, and this was about turning attitudes over feminism at the turn of the century. It was very much centred around the condemnation of women, which is of course a reference to Mora and both her father and brother's treatment of her. 
What about the awakening also has a double meaning about her very much beginning to wake up to what's going on. We also get a strong focus on her room number 1011, which we also see as the number on the treatment room in the asylum. I did look about the ship at the end to see if it was present there, but unfortunately I couldn't pick up on it, so if you managed to, you've done a better job than me, and let me know in the comments. Now described as a bad dream, Mora goes through the ship looking for Captain Ike. Crawling through the tunnel, she discovers a recreation of his home, whilst Daniel winds up visiting several locations as he climbs through the framework. We have what I believe is Angel and Ramirez before we get to Olex. Mora herself winds up in Daniel's and she starts to see the truth. Daniel returns to Mora's memories and climbing through a grave he comes across Elliot who gives him a wedding ring. He returns to Mora who finally starts to accept the truth and after she brings forth the key the pair attempt to escape before all restarts. We discover that the loop lasts 8 days and that Daniel became aware of it and passed through the ports during the restarts. It's basically like when you played a computer game a number of times and are aware of how to cheat through the game, whereas the NPCs inside aren't. Olek is taken out by a wave, Lucian's seizures become too much for him, and Angel is killed by falling rubble with he and Ramira telling the other the truth that they love them. The ship starts to sink and Franz locks one of the flood doors, trapping himself in order to save Tove. Ivan and Anka drown too, and very few people are left at this point. Those that die do so because they can't let go of the past, or the people on the ship that they feel emotionally invested in. This is very much echoed in Mora, who refuses to let go of Elliot. We discover that each character on board the ship had a traumatic experience in their past, and that they're reliving these painful memories because they can't escape from them. I view the Prometheus as being a getaway for them, and rather than facing up to their pasts, they are running away from it. Kieran could potentially be obsessed with studying the human mind, and he might be using these journeys as a way to turn those on board into his guinea pigs. If his father owned a company that built these ships, then he would likely inherit that and now be running it. His sister and father would be the only ones capable of taking away control from him, and this might be why they're locked up inside of the simulation. This also makes me think of the Twilight Zone episode In Search of an Exit. This followed five characters stuck in a construct trying to figure out how to escape. In the end, it's revealed that they're all dolls, dreaming of a reality, similar to the discussion of the doll's house that we get in the episodes. Now it's also somewhat similar to The Evil Within, which basically followed someone trapped inside a simulated nightmare. The Kerberos is pulled into a cyclone in order to start the next cycle, and this transports it to the ship graveyard where the other ones were taken. Thus, breaking more out of the loop becomes paramount, and her father tells her that he just needs the key. From here we go into the finale, which shows a key moment of Mora and Elliot's time together. It's revealed that the bug is something he found, and he named Alfred, and Mora tells Elliot it would be wrong to keep it trapped. This is of course a nod to what's going on in the show, and there's very much this idea of not keeping people in cages. Now being transported to the ship graveyard also seems to lock them in too, as most of the floor panels are covered up. However, they manage to get into Daniel's whilst those on the ship watch as the virus takes over. Mora's father runs Elliot through what's really going on, and we see Mora was the one that actually placed her son in the simulation. Obsessed with the story of Plato's cave, she decided to create this simulated loop that keeps him alive, but it also hides from her that she has a child because of the painful memories that would come with it. She is very much the key, which fits in the pyramid and tells her to wake up. Daniel has other plans though, and he wants to wake Mora up without giving the key to her father. He hacks the mainframe, and this also allows the passengers on the ship to step into the traumatic memories of the characters, which somewhat bleed into each other. Here they find the others that died on the ship, but they are corrupted. As we know in reality, they are okay, but on the outside their minds may now be broken because of Kieran's experiments. Ike is shut down on the asylum by the man inside who, yeah, got no idea what his actual name is. Even, even the subtitles, yeah, they just call him crew member. So yeah, if you know, leave it below. Also change the reality of this video so I didn't make any mistakes. That, and I also got his name and made it the best breakdown ever. That would, that would really make my day. And Mora makes it back to her father and her dad alters it so we see the extended opening of the series. We discover that she is the creator and that she built upon her father's work. Though we know that Kieran was involved in this too, it's also important to bear in mind that Daniel is said to have built simulations as well. He wanted to use them more for good, and it's stated that they were all created as a way for people to escape their own pain. I believe that Mora wanted to escape the death of Elliot, which is shown by the fact his room is under a child's grave. The memories of him are very much locked in here, and I don't know if children would be making such a big journey through space. However, her father does tell him he's the key to it, and he seemingly wakes up, though not fully. Him being the key could mean he's the person who makes Mora realise the truth about their son, and this could snap her out of it. 
Either way, she's built this with him inside, so they could loop around with each other forever. Her father takes the key, but it doesn't work because Daniel changed the code and allowed the corruption to take over. We learn that he switched the pyramid and also placed the key in the wedding ring. This deletes the simulation and Mora wakes up back in the wilderness. Now rather than restarting it, he's taken them back to the first simulation they built. Daniel gets her to activate the new key and she states he'll always be there. However, upon her coming to, he isn't and there is a number of reasons that this could be. Now potentially, Daniel is left behind on Earth and the character we meet is more of a program used to wake Mora up if her brother ever takes over. He might also be dead, <laughs> that's, that's a theory we always go with him, they might be dead. Uh, yeah, and she could just be imagining him with, using him as a construct. He might be on the ship as well, but either way, Daniel tells her that her brother is now running things and that he's taken over the entire operation. And that takes us into theory time. Theory time. Whole, whole video is basically a theory time because I've got no, no idea what's going on. I'm a moron. Don't, don't watch any more of the video. You wasted your time. Time. Okay, so I think that Mora probably made this journey out with her brother and she was hit with the painful memories of what happened in her past, so she decided to hit up the old sim and just chill out. Her brother used this as an opportunity to take over, however, there's also the potential that they both agreed to go down for the long nap and he woke himself up. He then could have put Mora in an endless sim so she couldn't break from it and then launched his coup. Either way, he is aware that she's woken up and we close out the series zooming into her eye. This is important iconography as we typically pulled out of the characters when we re-enter the simulation. I think the next season will be about her reuniting with Daniel on the ship, if he is alive or if he's just a program or whatever he is. It seems that he could be a prisoner as his entire mission here has been to break her out of it, however, like I said, he may just be a fail safe to get her out in case her brother takes over. Kieran clearly has no issues with mentally torturing people and taking him down is definitely one of the main priorities at this point. The guy sounds like a bloody nutcase and it really asks you what would happen if someone insane was running the asylum. I think it would be even wilder if it's actually revealed that this whole ship is its own simulation and that we're even further into the bloody future. That's a wild theory time for now and I'll stop talking crap all the time. time, time. If you look closely at Mora here, you might also notice there's a lot of veins on her face. Guessing that space travel just drains you and that's why it's easier to stay in the simulation. I do think that next season Mora will discover that her son is in fact dead and she'll start to put together all the pieces of why she ran away in the first place. Maybe she actually willingly gave herself over the simulation and her brother could be helping her because that message at the end, it, it does, it could be interpreted as being something nice. With her being labelled the creator, also putting herself in, blocking herself off mentally, th th there might be another side of this story and though Kieran is clearly torturing people, it could also be revealed that Mora has had a hand in it too. I'll probably have another theory video coming out soon as you can't really trust anything in a show that's set so heavily around simulation, but those are my initial thoughts on what's happening at the end here. Now if you've been following the channel for a couple of years then you'll know that we absolutely love Dark. Picked it apart a number of times and it's one of my favourite shows of all time. Because of this I was really anticipating this series and I'm happy to say that I thoroughly enjoyed it. Often when a show has three brilliant entries, it's expected that a series by the same team should match up to that instantly. Going in I thought this would be difficult for 1899 and that it would be on the same level of Dark Season 1 if not slightly below it. However, I actually think it's better than that season and the cast and central mystery are just as enthralling as the later entries of that series would end up coming to be. A Dark was limited by the fact that a lot of people in the West wouldn't give it a chance because it was a foreign language show. In order to combat this, I think they've made it so the series has a wide number of actors from all over the world, with there being a multitude of languages so everyone can be on board. Pun not intended. I'm, I'm glad that they did that though, as I think everyone should definitely give this series a shot. It's super psychological and it will constantly keep you on your toes as we watch the mystery of what's going on playing out before us. 1899 is masterfully presented, with there being a feeling of unease throughout the entire thing. Not only do the languages make it so the characters can't fully communicate with others, but the environment itself is constantly shifting and confusing them. This is very much how the audience feel too, and throughout it there's a great atmosphere to the entire thing that just makes it unnerving. Shot in mostly either dark or dim circumstances, you never really know what's going on in the characters' minds or the show itself. This makes it gripping to watch, and I was constantly sat trying to figure out how everything linked together. The cast all feel distinctive as well too, and each one has their own backstory and traits that make them unique and special. Sometimes in shows, the side characters can often get lost, but whether it's the costume design or acting, 
I can pretty much remember every single character that appeared in the series. They are all fully three dimensional people hiding skeletons in their closet, and you understand what drives them and also what their hopes are. This is a testament to how good the writing in the series is, whereas the concepts of high level shows like this can often distract from the people involved, you do see performances that make the characters so complex. I think 1899 balances both its characters and concept really well, and it's an easy recommend from me. Those sons of a bitches are dark, they've done it again, and 1899 is another highbrow show that's gonna suck you right in as you try and figure out what's going on with the characters. Scores a very, 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 very solid 8 out of 10, and I'm excited to see what these guys bring to us next time. Now obviously I'd love to hear your thoughts on the series, so make sure you comment below and let me know. We are in a competition right now and giving away 3 copies of House of the Dragon Season 1 on the 15th of December, and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the season. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month, and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of Black Panther Wakanda Forever, which will be linked on screen right now. Lots of things going on in the film, and I'd definitely love to see you over there right after this. Out of the way, thanks for sitting through the video. I've been Paul, I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.